it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine, and in today's video on mastering EKGs, I'll be teaching you how to identify 10 miscellaneous diagnoses. For each one, I'll start by showing you the EKG and giving a one-line history. Feel free to pause the video at that time to test yourself before I discuss the relevant findings and diagnosis. I'll start off with a few relatively easy, commonplace diagnoses and progressively work up to the more advanced ones. To start us off, we have a middle-aged person with no significant past medical history who presents with two days of progressive, constant, non-exertional chest pain. The first thing you probably noticed was ST elevations in some leads, but if you look carefully, you'll see mild ST elevations in almost every lead. The combination of chest pain lasting more than a day and ST elevations that span more than one vascular territory is most consistent with pericarditis. The EKG findings in pericarditis are sometimes described as having four stages. In the first, which is seen within the first week after symptom onset, there is the aforementioned widespread ST elevations, which are less than five millimeters in height, along with PR depression. In addition, in the AVR specifically, there is ST depression and PR elevation. We see that PR elevation in AVR demonstrated in this EKG. Then in stage two, there is normalization of findings. Stage three, the timing of which is very variable and which may or may not occur in some patients, consists of widespread T-wave inversions. And stage four is normalization once again. In addition to the classically described stages, an interesting finding called Spodic's sign has also been described in pericarditis. This is the finding of downsloping TP segments, usually best seen in leads 2 and V4 through V6. In this EKG, it's particularly evident in V4. This finding can also be seen in acute MI. Next, here is the EKG of a middle-aged person who presented to the ER after an episode of syncope. Your inclination might be that this is a regular wide complex rhythm at a rate of about 96 beats per minute with an extreme QRS axis and no unambiguous P waves, making this an accelerated idioventricular rhythm. Without additional information, that would be a reasonable hypothesis, but it's not the actual diagnosis here. What if I told you that this is what the person's EKG might have looked like 48 hours prior. Now what do you see? We still don't see P waves, but the rhythm is narrow complex with a normal QRS axis. And what might stand out a little more than the lack of P waves are these T waves. They are quite prominent, and not just tall, but one might say peaked, leading to the correct diagnosis of hyperkalemia. In the case of this EKG, it suggests mild to moderate severity. And now, returning to the first EKG, this is a person with moderate to severe hyperkalemia. Let me summarize the EKG features of hyperkalemia. When mild, we see the aforementioned peak T waves, but there is a distinctive feature of the T waves beyond just their height. It's that they are narrow based. It's almost as if someone squeezed the base of the T wave and the top shut up in response. This is in contrast to the prominent hyperacute T waves seen in the first minutes of an acute MI, which can be equally tall, but which are unusually wide-based. Presumably, due to the prominence of the T waves, many EKG machines double count the heart rate here. So if the patient's heart rate is actually 70, the machine might report it as 140, mistaking the T waves for QRS complexes. As the hyperkalemia worsens, the QRS complex widens and patients can end up with sinus bradycardia, various forms of conduction block, including AV block and bundle branch blocks, and there can be a loss of visible P waves. An underappreciated phenomenon is hyperkalemia leading to a pseudostemi or brugada-like pattern in which the EKG shows prominent ST elevations in V1 and V2, which is not pictured here. And then when the potassium level is critically high, one can develop something called a sinoventricular rhythm in which the sinus node is still firing and conducting to the AV node via intranodal pathways, but the atria themselves may depolarize 
so late that B waves become buried within the wide and bizarre QRS complexes, or alternatively, the atria don't depolarize at all. Profound hyperkalemia will eventually result in such a prolonged and bizarre QRS that the distinction between QRS complex and T wave becomes lost, leading to what is sometimes referred to as a sine wave rhythm, which I personally find frustrating because it's not literally a sine wave. Now, the reason that I've placed mild, moderate, and severe all in quotation marks is because these are relative and arbitrary designations. It's common to see in both textbooks and web resources that specific findings are listed under specific ranges of serum potassium, but that is nonsense. The presence of EKG manifestations and risk of death is related to not only the absolute potassium concentration, but also to the rate of increase and the presence of other concurrent electrolyte disturbances. And the EKG is probably not as sensitive for picking up hyperkalemia as is commonly believed anyway. I've seen more than one patient with a potassium above 7 and a stone-cold normal EKG. EKG number 3. An older patient with a history of lung cancer presents with subacute onset of progressive dyspnea. We see the patient has a sinus tachycardia and low QRS voltage. And if you look carefully, you might have noticed that the amplitude of the QRS complexes in some leads alternates between two values. The term for this finding is electrical alternance, and it is the EKG hallmark of a large pericardial effusion. What's happening here is the effusion around the heart acts as an electrical insulator, hence the low voltage, and the heart is literally rocking back and forth within the bag of extra pericardial fluid, resulting in a mild shift in the heart's position, which causes the alternating QRS morphologies. The significance of the tachycardia is that it mildly suggests the possibility of hemodynamic compromise, meaning pericardial tamponade, which would explain this patient's dyspnea, but it's important to note that the other two findings of electrical alternans and low voltage only mean there's an effusion, their presence does not mean there is tamponade per se. Here is the EKG of an elderly person found down on the sidewalk. There is an irregularly irregular wide complex rhythm of about 72 beats per minute. No unambiguous regular atrial activity, so maybe AFib. If we look at V2 and V3, the QT seems prolonged. But what it really stands out once you've noticed it is the unusual terminal deflection of the QRS complex. It looks sort of like an R prime wave, but it's, it's really wide. This is called a J wave, or more commonly in the US at least, an Osborne wave, the hallmark of hypothermia. Other EKG features seen in hypothermia include PR, QRS, and QT prolongation, and various bradyarrhythmias including AFib with slow ventricular response. Here's an EKG finding I come across on the wards a few times per year. A clinical history in this case is actually irrelevant. At first glance, with a negative QRS complex in lead 1 and positive complex in AVF, it looks like plain old right axis deviation. However, right axis deviation is almost always accompanied by other EKG abnormalities, such as evidence of RVH or pathologic Q waves. So what's going on here? This is an example of lead reversal, also known as lead transposition, caused by two wires being switched when the EKG was recorded. In this case, it was the wires to the right and left arms that were switched. To understand the specific changes, we can revisit Eindhoven's triangle. In the case of left and right arm transposition, we can see that the positions of leads 2 and 3 switch, that of AVL and AVR switch. Lead 1 is oriented in the opposite direction, and AVF is essentially unaffected. So if we return to the EKG, let's switch AVR and AVL, and then 2 and 3. And finally, invert lead 1, meaning we'll flip it vertically. And this gives us a reverse-engineered normal EKG. In practice, however, when faced with an EKG that looks like lead reversal, you presumably won't know for certain that's the case. So as long as the patient is still there, repeat the recording 
ensuring that the wires are properly hooked up. Switching precordial wires among themselves can also occur, which will result in unusual jumps in R wave progression. And switching a limb electrode wire with a precordial one can result in a variety of bizarre manifestations which are substantially harder to predict from first principles. So we are halfway through and at diagnosis number six, a patient with no cardiac history presenting to the pre-op clinic prior to an irrelevant elective surgical procedure. At first, examining just the limb leads, this might look like another case of left arm, right arm lead reversal with a right axis deviation. In this case, an axis of about negative 180. But what is going on in the precordial leads? This patient has reverse R wave progression in which the R waves get progressively smaller as one moves from V1 to V2. And by V3, the R waves are essentially gone altogether. This is a patient with dextrocardia, in which due to an abnormality in the earliest stages of embryonic development, the heart is literally located on the opposite side of the thorax as a mirror image of the normal heart. To see what effect that has on the EKG, let's take a look at the precordial leads relative to the heart as seen on an axial cross section. Normally V1 and V2 are over the right ventricle, with leads V3 through V6 being over the left ventricle. Since the net electrical vector of ventricular depolarization is directed from the base of the heart to the apex, the QRS complex is usually more prominent and positive in the lateral precordial leads. In dextrocardia, however, the net electrical vector is pointed to the right, in more of an opposite direction of the lateral precordial leads, and it's also physically farther away. The net result is that the EKG of a person with dextrocardia will have limb leads that look like a left arm, right arm transposition, V1 and V2 are switched, and V3 through V6 look like the right-sided leads you would check if you suspected the patient was having a right ventricular infarct. So in order to record an interpretable EKG in a patient with dextrocardia, essentially the wires to the limb leads need to be attached as a mirror image to normal, and the precordial electrodes need to be applied to the chest wall as a mirror image to what's normal. At that point, the EKG can be interpreted just as you would on any other patient. Most patients with dextrocardia have otherwise morphologically normal hearts. An elderly person experiences loss of consciousness several minutes after the abrupt onset of a headache. Jumping right to the obvious, this EKG shows giant symmetric precordial T-wave inversions. The list of etiologies of this finding include an acute MI, such as that seen in Wellens syndrome, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, stress cardiomyopathy, also known as Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, and the diagnosis in this case, subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is an elderly person presenting with intermittent lightheadedness. You may have picked up quickly on the complete heart block, but at the beginning of the video, I mentioned that the EKGs will be getting more advanced, and this is number eight out of 10. So while this patient does have complete heart block, there is something else going on that's nicely demonstrated here. Look carefully at the P to P interval. That is the duration between two successive P waves. It's not constant and instead seems to switch between two values. Those PP intervals labeled with red are about 680 milliseconds, while those labeled with blue are about 760 milliseconds. The difference is relatively small, but consistent enough to suggest a specific phenomenon. Do you notice anything else that's different about those two PP intervals when they occur? Well, the shorter ones include a QRS complex, while the longer ones don't. This is known as ventriculophasic sinus arrhythmia. And aside from the fact that the patient is in complete heart block, which is a serious problem, having this on top of that is more or less a physiologic curiosity rather than an additional problem. This is an EKG of a young adult with depression who was found unresponsive at home with an empty pill bottle nearby. The notable features here are a borderline sinus tachycardia, QRS prolongation, QT prolongation, which in this case is very severe, and the most distinctive feature of this particular diagnosis, there is a rightward deviation of the terminal 40 milliseconds of the QRS axis. Although that's how the last feature is framed in the literature, 
it's a bit confusing to think about it that way. So it could be simplified as there being a prominent R wave in AVR and a prominent S wave in one. Together, these are features of tricyclic antidepressant overdose. At toxic levels, TCAs block the fast sodium channels within the Hisperkinji system and myocardium, resulting in similar effects as class 1A antiarrhythmics such as quinidine and procanamide. All of these drugs can slow the conduction velocity and prolong the action potential, resulting in QRS prolongation and QT prolongation respectively. The sinus tachycardia that is frequently seen with TCA overdose is a consequence of its anticholinergic effect. If there's an explanation for the prominent R in AVR, that is why TCA toxicity causes an axis shift, I am unable to locate it. And finally, here is our last EKG for today. And I'll give you a clue that it's the rhythm we're interested in. Let's focus on just one of the rhythm strips. It looks like the patient is in sinus rhythm and has a few premature ventricular contractions or PVCs. So what's the big deal? Well, let's consider the coupling interval of those PVCs. For those not familiar, the coupling interval is the duration between the start of the sinus-driven QRS complex and a subsequent premature QRS complex. When a patient is experiencing unifocal PVCs, that is PVCs with the same morphology, presumably because they are originating from the same focus within the ventricles, the coupling interval is usually constant or at the most changes only a little bit. In this case though, the first coupling interval is about 680 milliseconds, the second is about 500 milliseconds, and the third is about 400 milliseconds. That's a big difference, which is really unusual. So let's look at another interval, the PVC to PVC interval. In contrast, this interval is precisely the same at 1560 milliseconds. Now granted, we only have three PVCs and thus two intervals to compare. So this could just be coincidence, but for the sake of learning, I'll tell you that it's not coincidence. This is an example of ventricular parasystole. Ventricular parasystole is a rare phenomenon in which a ventricular focus is firing at a fixed rate due to abnormal automaticity, but it is surrounded by a region of unidirectional block so that electrical signals can leave the parasystolic focus and trigger a PVC, but signals can't get in, which means there's no overdrive suppression of the parasystolic focus. It doesn't get reset by normal ventricular depolarization that's occurring all around it. Instead, it just keeps firing along at its own rate, oblivious to what the rest of the heart is doing. Why do we only see three PVCs? Why don't they just march right through the whole rhythm strip? Well, if we follow out where you might expect them to occur, this one presumably lands within the refractory period of the rest of the surrounding ventricle caused by the preceding normal depolarization. And the next parasystolic firing definitely falls within the refractory period. What happened before the three PVCs? In this case, the electrical signal from normal AV conduction just barely beat out the parasystolic focus to depolarize the ventricles. If AV conduction had taken 40 milliseconds later, we might have seen a fusion complex there instead. Ventricular parasystole is a hard diagnosis to make and it typically requires a much longer recording than the 10 second EKG before a constant PVC to PVC interval can be identified marching through an otherwise normal rhythm. And parasystole is not limited to the ventricles. It can also be seen in the atria, in which case there are PACs that are firing with a constant PAC to PAC interval, whose timing is not impacted by the sinus nodes depolarization of the surrounding atria. That's it for these 10 miscellaneous EKG diagnoses. I hope you found today's video to be interesting and helpful.